Good morning and welcome on this fine November 19th, uh, 2021. And um, thanks, Paul, for your comments. Sorry not uh, going yet this morning. Got back from BC via US late last night. Oh, Paul Prevost, thanks. Uh, just messaged me on LinkedIn and said uh, that he just got back this morning from BC. Wow, you uh, would have had a, a, quite the trip coming back uh, through the, the US. So um, I just want to do a, a quick introduction for those that are joining us live. This is the agency. It's a live stream that's going to be occurring uh, daily for the foreseeable future. And we are going to be focused on uh, having a, a discussion across the country around uh, what's going on in, in British Columbia the last six months? We, we can include a little bit about COVID, but really this is going to be a forum and a platform uh, about disaster and emergency management in Canada. And, and we're going to include aspects where we bring in individuals from the disaster and emergency management, disaster risk reduction, risk management worlds to provide advice and considerations for those who are in BC right now uh, doing any advanced planning around the recovery and the response and uh, even the preparedness going into winter because as we know on the Coquihalla, they are uh, definitely moving into winter season, which is avalanche season. There's very good avalanche preparedness along the highway, but as we've seen, uh, no amount of preparedness can can get us ready for things to come. So I'm live streaming uh, on LinkedIn through my profile on LinkedIn, on YouTube, and through Twitter. Uh, I can receive comments on LinkedIn and through the live chat on our Hazardscape YouTube channel. So if if you want to view through those channels, you can actually post comments and and I'll see them come through and we can interact a little bit. Morning, Stacy. Awesome. <clears throat> Very happy to have uh, some Indigenous representation because Indigenous knowledge sharing is going to be a big part of this as, as we move forward. So, Stacy, I'm going to invite you to come on here uh, at some point uh, so we can have a discussion about the great things that you're doing uh, in emergency management. So thanks for, for, for commenting there. So I, I want to set the context <clears throat> for what we're doing first. Uh, this is going to be a, a daily live stream at 8.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9.30 Mountain Standard. I guess that's 11 out east, maybe even 12.30 if you're way, way east. And I'm, I'm going to be bringing on experts, subject matter experts in the emergency social services field, the emergency management field, risk management field from uh, Canada, the United States, Australia, all around the world to start to create this forum and knowledge base of, of sharing and discussion around the field of emergency management. Because I think uh, it's, it's been pointed out many, many times within the, the very small emergency management community, Canada is not well prepared. We, uh, we've, lot of, uh, we've let a lot of things slip. And, and I don't want this to be a, a political debate or, you know, a very partisan discussion, but we are going to provide observation and facts. And, and there has been a lot of things that have gone on in the last 20 years that have not contributed to a, a more prepared Canada. Some of the things on, on uh, you know, that, that uh, are quite personal to me is we, we lost the joint uh, emergency preparedness program grant uh, for almost nine years. Um, I, I think, you know, the heavy, heavy urban search and rescue program that was well supported by the federal government um, in, in the past has, has not been as well supported as it should be. And I think right now uh, that's evident because not every heavy urban search and rescue team across Canada, uh, in my opinion, has uh, equal 
status. Some are uh, doing much better than others. Some are training much better than others. Some are better resourced. And I, I think we need to have that evened out across the country because those teams are critical to what to the resources and the incident management that we need in the country. Uh, we need. We're going to talk a lot about professionalization of emergency management. So, if if you are not at all familiar with the with emergency management in Canada, um, you know, engineering, medical profession, accountants, uh, even human resource professionals are are professionalized and, and in a lot of ways regulated. Emergency management is not. And so the the people in your communities that are responsible for uh, planning and and preparing and trying to influence government to take on the right mitigation projects um, are are left to be often in a community on their own, uh, wearing multiple hats, as we say, emergency management uh, might be their job function, but they they will also have other jobs in the community. And the lack of professionalization and, and regulation around the, the disaster and emergency management field means that it doesn't get the support and recognition that it should at, at an employer level and even at a government uh, policy regulation level. So many, many communities, I, I wanna say over 90% of rural and remote communities are extremely under-resourced in the country in terms of what they're expected to do to prepare their community for emergencies and disasters. Um, e even looking at the fire, uh, the fire services, the Alberta or the Canadian Fire Chiefs Association issued a report a couple of years ago talking about how you know it's it's no longer fire services; it's now fire and rescue. Um, they have been. They've had added responsibilities put on them um, without uh, the, the right funding. And that's having uh, a significant impact on the service that we get as well. And if, again, if you're not familiar with emergency management in Canada um, and BC has been an eye opener for you, I, I want to say that it's a very tight knit community because it's, it's a relatively small community made up of academics operational personnel at all three levels of, gov of government, uh, trainers, contractors across the country, consulting companies across the country. And it, it's, it's, it's small in the sense that, um, you know, a, a large community like, uh, let's say a relatively large one, I'll use in, in Alberta town of Stony Plain, <clears throat> they have a director, uh, of, of protective services, which is very often the case in, in many communities, but they're responsible also for recreation and fire and emergency management. And so the amount of time that they can spend on true emergency management program development, um, it, it's, it, it's not a hundred percent. It's sometimes it's not even 50%. And I, I think um, you know, we're going to have people come on this live stream. They're going to talk about what it's like to be an emergency manager in their community. They're going to come on and share their knowledge and insight uh, at, at 1030 Mountain Standard Time, 930 Pacific Standard Time. We're going to have Dr. Julie Drillette from the Social Work and Disaster Network come on and talk about emergency social services. Then after that, around 1115 Mountain Standard Time, we're going to have Shannon Salinsky from Autism Canada come in and talk about uh, livestock uh, emergency management. Uh, we're also lining up some uh, people on the ground in the Abbotsford area uh, from different NGOs and the municipalities there. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. We're going to have other experts come on, uh, experts in incident management planning, and we're going to talk about the recovery and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, emergency managers around Canada, around the nation will tune into this, maybe play it off the side of their desk, listen in or, or watch the recordings and be able to grab, grab tidbits of advice and knowledge and 
uh, meet others uh, who who are in a similar role and similar situation so they can connect with each other and and we can start to build that more cohesive national conversation um, because I think a lot in emergency management would agree that um, we we need to we need to ramp up our voices and and speak a little bit more to what's going on and what needs to be done in Canada to make us better prepared for the future. And I, I will say that, um, you know, this is not going to be a, a, a focus on climate change because I think climate change, there's enough conversation going on in other areas where we can focus on, you know, disaster risk reduction and professionalizing emergency management in Canada and, you know, creating a better emergency management network and maybe, you know, getting, uh, you know, being the squeaky wheel within different levels of government that uh, maybe will will listen a little bit more than they have. Because I can tell you firsthand, and I, I've put this out on Twitter uh, probably many times over the years, that, uh, you know, especially in Alberta, like the, the Gronenveld report that that was done by an MLA out of uh, the town of High River that was published internally in the government in late 2006, 2007, was purposefully uh, kept confidential until 2013 after the, the Calgary floods. Uh, I was in meetings with uh, high level senior government officials where we were told that the, the Gronenveld report on flood mitigation in Southern Alberta is, is not to be shared because uh, they didn't want this idea that there was this risk out there, nothing was being done about it because there were there's developers that, that make a lot of money from building in flood zones. There's municipalities that get a lot of in, uh, property tax revenue from having homes in nice areas on the river or in a, a a drained lake or at the bottom of an ancient riverbed. Uh, there's there's a lot of realtors that sell a lot of those homes. And, you know, there's a lot of insurance companies that uh, for a long time were, were, not, were, were kind of avoiding offering flood insurance because they saw flooding as the new fire. Uh, over the last 20 years across Canada, basements in homes have have been significantly upgraded from dirt basements or just a cement floor with you know the the two by four walls and and no drywall no carpet people are finishing their basements it's getting extremely expensive to recover in in a large community that has a beautiful well-built livable basements and so i i think for many years the insurance companies uh, avoided the area of uh, flood insurance. They've recently come on board because they've been able to, uh, uh, you know, single out postal codes that they will not insure, single out postal codes that they will insure based on risk. And and government has pushed them a little bit more to, to uh, create flood insurance over the years. It, it's getting better. But there's been a lot going on in Canada that you know, someone who's not in the emergency management field might not be aware of. Even the system itself of emergency management needs to needs to change. Uh, it was born out of the the fifties, out of wartime civil defense. Uh, governments and and businesses, corporations took over the emergency management concept uh, through the seventies, eighties from the, the military because they thought they could do a better job in, in the public service realm and, and businesses like the idea of being better prepared and, and to manage their risks because they're profit driven. And, you know, they saw the value in, you know, spending a couple dollars per hundred dollars on, on mitigation and preparedness because they know that uh, that money, that investment is going to come back seven 10 times uh, more when, when it comes time to recover. So 
Uh, we're dealing with an emergency management system that was born out of the nuclear, the, the nuclear risk, wartime risk, uh, transferred into government hands. And, you know, I, I think that system has, is long overdue in terms of change and not even improvement. Uh, emergency management has been continuously improved, you know, like through through cycles of trying to iterate it and 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 use other tools like Lean Six Sigma to try and make it better. But I, I don't know if we can continually improve the system anymore. I, I think I, I'm of the opinion that we need to stop improving it and really take a look at it and and come up with something new and and completely different. Um, you know, I, I had a, 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 and I'm talking to an extreme where, you know, a lot of counties and municipalities in, at least in Alberta, where I'm from, and I have a lot of experience with, you know, those county borders were drawn up a long, long time ago. And some of those counties are more populated than others. Some have more oil and gas revenue. And, and and some are doing better than others. And, and a lot of that is because of the borders. And a lot of counties that have very expensive properties down on ancient riverbeds, on rivers, are generate a lot of revenue because they need to keep those properties in place to, to keep the property tax revenue in place. I mean, if we were to redraw the borders of counties in Alberta, to reshape the the province and uh, have have counties that are smaller grab more land and more property and, and have others that are doing better in different areas and, and shrink those, there would be a significant opportunity to mitigate and and turn a lot of land into parks that aren't going to be impacted by disasters in the next hundred years. So I'm I'm talking about, uh, system reform at, at that scale. And I think a lot of others who are much smarter than me in the academic world are doing a lot of research. But again, they're they're researching old systems and, and they're trying to come up with ways to improve the current system. And I, I just don't know if we can improve it anymore. So we're going to have a lot of discussion about that. And so if you are uh, tuning in, leave me a comment if you're on LinkedIn. Our our YouTube channel has a live chat. If you want to flip over to the Hazardscape channel on YouTube and then Twitter, we're coming in live. I don't get the comments from Twitter. So uh, just uh, if, if you are commenting on Twitter, that's great. But if you want to be able to interact and post questions or comments to me that I can put on the air, then we will do that. Um, like I said, today at 1030 Mountain, we're going to have Dr. Julie Drillet. She is the lead for the social work and disaster management uh, and disaster network. We're going to be talking about emergency social services. She's also a professor of social work at the University of Calgary. So we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, what are emergency social services volunteers doing on the ground in BC right now? What are some of the functions, you know? What are they going to need to consider as we move into the the short term intermediate recovery and into the long term recovery? And then we'll have Shannon Solinsky uh, on talking about the livestock end because there is uh, a lot of overwhelming photos coming out of BC around farmers trying to save their their livestock. Uh, luckily, they were just able to redirect some livestock feed from China at the Port of Vancouver and get some trucks coming into Abbotsford. So that's good news. Uh, Shannon's going to be on at about quarter after 11 with us. So um, if if you are a subject matter expert emergency manager in Canada and you have information, knowledge, advice that you want to share to emergency management professionals in BC right now, please go to hazardscape.com. Uh, slash agency. You can register your your name and your availability on that website. That's hazardscape.com forward slash agency. Uh, and you can go there. 
Um, I know uh, Peron Goodyear from the Salvation Army Emergency Disaster Services team is on his way to BC. And we're going to be uh, trying to get a hold of him live in the coming days as, as he talks to us about what's going on on the ground and the Salvation Army uh, EDS team's role. And again, hoping to have others come on this platform uh, to discuss and share. Um, e even if um, <clears throat> you have the, the sudden courage to want to come on live at any given moment when I don't have a guest on, please feel free to send me a, a, a note through a LinkedIn comment uh, on this live feed or through the YouTube, and I will send you the, the link to this, the studio directly. Uh, or you can even email me at brad.eisen, I-S-O-N, at hazardscape.com. Email me directly, and we'll get you on. <clears throat> So as we uh, as we wait for Dr. Drillette to come on, uh, I'm I'm just going to share some things that are other things that are going on uh, across Canada that might be helpful for those uh, in British Columbia who are right now up to their necks in uh, in in a, in work at either the emergency operations center or uh, maybe they're able to get some rest right now. <clears throat> but there there's there's a lot of resources uh, on the Alberta government website from their experience with the floods from 2013. Uh, Australia has a lot of good resources centered around uh, recovery and what Australia is doing and their recovery from flooding and bushfires. So, you know, please take advantage of that information uh, if you can. We're going to have experts, advanced planning experts coming on throughout the, the course of these live streams, which I'm going to run daily uh, for the foreseeable future. You know, I, I don't know if daily is going to be too much or or not enough. I don't know, but we're going to see what kind of response we get and go from there. I tend to kind of shoot first and aim later with some of these things. So, uh, you know, bear with me as we produce guests and get people coming on, I might be on here ranting uh, on my own for a little while before we get to uh, to a lot more people. But we will have these uh, videos and the audio from these available for, uh, you know, watching or, or listening later. Trying not to call it a podcast. I, I don't want to fit under the podcast, uh, you know, the, the podcast realm because I think this is, is going to be a little bit more than that. This is going to be a lot of live discussion, uh, live streaming and, and discussion in the context of BC, because I think we're in it for a long time. Uh, when I say a long time, I mean, I'm looking at uh, maybe major highways, TransCanada or Coquihalla, getting to single lane alternate traffic, for essential travel only, maybe by the spring of 2022 uh, or the summer. Uh, I don't, I'm not an engineer, but I, I've been enough, uh, worked with enough engineers on municipal infrastructure to know that, you know, there's a lot of things that you've got to consider around uh, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. You can't just start working in navigable waters where there's fish habitat anytime you want. Hey, Neil Tran, thanks for coming on uh, and for your comment. Hey, Shannon, uh, glad glad you guys could tune in. We're going to be chatting a lot. So, yeah, you can't just, you know, put equipment in, in a major river at any time of the year. There's, there's fish habitat that there's a concern for. Um, if if it's too wet, I mean, you've got weather to deal with. We're heading into avalanche season in winter. Uh, it gets cold up in the Coquihalla. You're, you could be dealing with some frozen ground, ice. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much to factor in uh, about trying to get even workers and, and even in a safe area to bring in heavy equipment on some of those slopes. 
I mean, the engineering is, is going to be incredible on this. And, and I, you know, I just don't see it happening quick. I, I mean, you look at the landslide, the rock slide that happened on the single lane into Tofino, BC, uh, you know, that, that took a long time to clean up and to reinforce that road. So, you know, I, I, I think the impacts of that too are, are going to be around. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Shannon, there are uh, so many considerations right now. We, we have to consider that, you know, if people are not able to drive in and out of Vancouver at a reasonable, in a, in a reasonable time frame for work or for other things, then what's that going to mean for, for air traffic? Uh, what's that going to mean for the airports out of Vancouver? What's that going to mean for the airports out of Victoria and, and in Nanaimo? Um, I, I would expect that they're going to see a significant increase in, in travel because people aren't going to be able to drive anywhere. Even we're coming up to Christmas. I mean, a lot of people come from Vancouver over to Eastern Canada for Christmas or, or the West to, to Vancouver, BC. And, uh, I, you know, our son was going to drive from the Nimo this winter for Christmas. I don't know if he's going to, if he's going to do that now because of, of the travel issues. So well, we'll have to, uh, yeah, absolutely, in commuter rail too. We'll we'll see transit increases. We'll we'll see what the rail lines, <clears throat> excuse me, are, are like. Um, you know, so many issues. Twenty five hundred trucks I heard last in, in sitting in Hope. Um, I, I yeah, Caitlin, absolutely. What is what is it going to mean for vacation rules around air and train travel? Those might be significantly restricted. It, it might be essential, essential air traffic only, essential personnel only, uh, on on trains and, and vacation rules. I'm I'm excited to hear from Peron, who is uh, heading from Salvation Army Emergency Disaster Services into BC. You know how is he getting in? What's his travel like? So Peron, if you can give us any info, if you're listening on that, uh, I'll be pulling you in uh, absolutely for that. Yeah, business travel for agriculture supporting cleanup. And, and that doesn't even, you know, consumer goods, absolutely, supply chain. Uh, we're going into a major retail season right now. Oh, my gosh. You know, what else? We're, we're probably going to overwhelm people uh, as, as we talk a lot about this. And I, that's not what it's, it's meant for. But um, if, if you're in a situation where you're doing advanced recovery planning for BC, uh, this is the place to going to be to get uh, a lot of feedback um, a lot of expert insight and consideration as you go forward. I know personally from the 2013 floods in Alberta uh, and, and the 2011 and 12, 12 floods that we had in Southern Alberta, there, there's so much that comes up out of the blue with these things that you just can't plan for. When, when you're on your own uh, in a small community, focused on the day-to-day -day operations, you know, strategy uh, is really hard to to focus on. Forward thinking strategy is really hard to focus on when you're tired, when your family and friends are impacted, when you have to be at work every day trying to help your community and, and others, uh, you know, are outside of the emergency operations center trying to just survive. So there, there's a lot of things go on. We're also going to bring in uh, mental health experts. Uh, I'm going to try and get uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, either in BC or Alberta, on as well. So we can talk a little bit about uh, emergency management, first responder, mental health. I know there are a lot of people out there uh, that, that have expertise in that field. I work very closely with Canadian Mental Health Association, Alberta. They, they are doing a lot of great things in rural, remote spaces of the province. Uh, I know uh, CMHA, British Columbia, has a lot of programs and resources. I know that Alberta Health Services in Alberta has a ton of training and programs sitting on the shelf because they lost their funding to deliver those programs across Alberta after the grants ran out in 2018. 
uh, the the flood grants ran out in 2018, so they can't deliver them. Um, you know, they th those programs were were born out of a flood recovery and a flood response only eight years ago. So there's a ton of opportunity to share that uh, into BC and access that knowledge in those book programs. So we're not reinventing the wheel. They they are all evidence based, well researched, uh, developed by experts in so many different fields. Um, we're we're going to try and get some of those people on as well to to talk about those. So if if you're tuning in or you know someone right now that's in the Fraser Valley, Chilliwack, Abbotsford, Hope Mission, Princeton, any of that Southwest BC that is either in an emergency operations center, involved in emergency management or remote uh, emergency social services. You know, please let them know about these live streams. We're going to be going daily, uh, 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, 9.30 Mountain. We're, we're going to go daily for a little while. I, I will do my best to sustain that. Uh, I'm also looking for anybody that wants to come on and co-host or produce some of this because I've got some workshops that I've got to deliver next week in the morning. So, you know, if there's a, a brave soul out there who wants to access uh, our live stream capability and platform i am more than willing to connect in with you and, and talk to you about uh you about getting you set up so you can do some co-hosting and production uh it's you know it's going to be a great experience you're going to get to to learn a lot of people especially if there's some students out there in emergency management that just want to get into the field and, and start networking this would be a great opportunity for you to just come in and facilitate the discussion. You don't even need to have a lot of emergency management knowledge. In fact, I think having a little bit less uh, knowledge would be better because it's gonna, it's gonna help you be a little bit more curious. So please, uh, please feel free to contact me at brad.eisen at hazardscape.com. If you wanna talk about that, um, we're, we're gonna have guests coming in. And as I said earlier, we're going to have Dr. Julie Drillette from the Social Work and Disaster Network uh, on in about 20 minutes. We're going to be talking emergency social services. And then Shannon Selinsky uh, with Autism Canada, we're going to be talking about uh, livestock and, and other things. And Shannon runs a, uh, trains a search and rescue for autism program that I think would be greatly beneficial right now for those in, in impacted areas of BC who have family or friends, or you know, there's, if you're a volunteer that are helping families with adults and children who have autism, uh, Shannon's got a ton of tools and information on how to support them, uh, especially in uh, a, a reception center where it's very noisy, it's very chaotic, there's a lot going on. Uh, I had Autism Canada on a live stream uh, a few months ago where we talked about uh, emergency kits for autism and, and preparedness. So we'll be getting in, in into a lot of that stuff. So, uh, you know, even if you're in BC or if you're outside of BC, there's going to be a lot of information here for you to consider that you can place in your programs. And again, like I said, we, we also want to use this to amplify the current state of disaster and emergency management in Canada. It, it's, it's not as, as good as it could be. It's, it's evolved a lot over the last couple of decades. But given, given Canada and the remote rural nature of a lot of our geography, uh, we, we are not well suited for uh, response we're not even that well suited in, in terms of mitigation. I, I know the, the federal government will, will say things like they've got a, a mitigation and adaptation grant program that provides funding for mitigation. It's, it, it doesn't even, uh, it, it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even touch the amount of infrastructure that needs to be upgraded in this country. It, it doesn't even start to address the high risk areas. And I can tell you why it doesn't start to address a lot of the high risk areas because we don't even really know what the high risk areas are in, in a, in a, in a good sense. 
Uh, there, there's splatterings of uh, communities and, and provinces that have done hazard identification risk assessments. But I, I don't think at a national level and in a lot of provinces, there's not a, a good data set on where are we really the most vulnerable. I mean, we know that uh, infrastructure is crumbling. We know that there's flood risks, Man Manitoba, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Quebec, high in the flood risk zones, BC on the fire. Um, we, we know the fire and flood stuff well. We know where a lot of tornadoes show up. Uh, we're, we're very, I, I think cyber attacks are uh, one area of concern. Um, if, if we're looking at taking what's called an all hazards approach to emergency management, me, meaning we look at all hazards that exist. Um, if, if, if there's someone out there that, that can definitively provide us data and research and a report that says, hey, Canada should be focusing on A, B, and C in these areas first, no matter what, and that's where we need to shore things up and, and do some mitigation. Great, bring that to this forum uh, if you've got that. I'm I'm happy to, you know, sit here and say I didn't know that. Uh, this forum is here as a way for me to say and others to say, you know what? I don't know, but we're gonna find the people that do, and we're gonna find out, and we're gonna share that. That's what this is about. So, um, you know, there that that's one big topic that I think is gonna come out of this. Uh, there are there is great work being done uh, out of BC through different foundations. I, if I misquote who's doing it, uh, please forgive me. But they they I, I think it had to do with um, Royal Roads and some other organizations. They've developed, you know, climate change competencies. So if you're in the engineering field. Uh, or a field that works very closely with disaster risk reduction. Uh, you know, you maybe you're a practitioner within climate change. You know, they've developed competencies that that you can access and work towards that will help you do your job better and get better results and, and have better performance. Um, I think we need to talk about that that availability as we look at emergency management and disaster management professionalization in Canada. I know there are groups out there working on competencies for emergency management in Canada. Uh, um, if, 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 if you're part of those working groups, um, contact me directly and, and we'll get you on here so we can amplify that discussion for you. We, we are going to, um, I think we have an opportunity now to tug on the ear of some very influential people across the country. I, I think we have that opportunity. I think we need to take advantage of it right now because BC, it, it's, you know, this is not a contained disaster or impact. You, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the ripple effect of what's going on in BC is going to be felt. Uh, all the way to Eastern Canada and down through the the U.S. Uh, as that ripple expands and, and moves through uh, the, the geography. Um, again, Indigenous knowledge sharing is going to be a big piece of this because I guarantee you, uh, we have not listened to the to Indigenous uh, leaders and elders enough. They have tons of stories that talk about hazard impact in certain areas of the country uh, that, that we need to do a better job of accessing. Uh, I'm certain there are stories down uh, in the Sumas Prairies area that, uh, that are in, in various Indigenous First Nation communities that talk about the flooding that's happened there. You know, this is the fourth flood, right? Uh, this is the fourth major flood through that, that area, uh, 1920s, 1948, 1990, now. And, you know, here's a question I've got, actually. Yeah, absolutely, Shannon. Um, these are not a one-off and impacts across the country over so many industries and businesses. 
I, I don't know what happened in Abbotsford in 1991, but they saw a 450% increase in population in actually 96, I think it was. So 1990, when, when there was a flood uh, over, over the Trans-Canada Highway in the Sumas Prairies, the population of Abbotsford was 18,000. In 96, it jumped uh, 456% to whatever that is, about 100,000. And, and today they're sitting at 120, I think uh, last I checked, it was around 141,000. Don't quote me on that number. Um, we, uh, you know, I'll, I'll check on that, but you know, I, I would suspect in 1990 when there's only 18,000 people, no, no social media, uh, and it's, and it's mostly rural, you know, a, a flood is not going to be that significant in terms of impact and, you know, farmers and, and ranchers are, are pretty resilient. They're, they're going to flood, they're going to deal with it. Um, they, they might, uh, raise some issues uh, about it locally, but you know, they've got to continue on and get back to work. They don't have time to, to necessarily take on and advocate for this. And, and maybe they think it's also just a one-time thing. So, you know, I'm not surprised that a lot of people don't know about the previous floods in those areas. I'm not surprised that now with 140,000 people in, in Abbotsford and social media, uh, this disaster is amplified. Um, you know, the, this is not a natural disaster. There, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. There are environmental hazards. There are human-induced hazards. There are hazards that exist because of, of nature and, and people. But those hazards do not become uh, a disaster until they impact built-up areas and people. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. 1997 Abbotsford Airport became a jet passenger airport. One reason for... Okay, awesome. So airport uh, had, a, had a big... I bet you in 96, people knew that the airport was, was being built. So developers probably jumped at the opportunity to build, uh, build up there and, and build in flood zones and build in flood plains and flood fringe plains because airports were coming in. Uh, great point, Caitlin, that, that probably explains it. Absolutely. So, you know, back, back at that time when they were looking at, you know, what was the airport going to do for Abbotsford? Great economy, uh, more population, more people, you know, what, what was done at that time to say, Hey, we just had a major flood here six years ago. What does that mean for the future? Um, I, I don't know. I don't have any information on that, but I, I don't even know if that was a, a conversation. I, I can uh, guarantee you if it's anything like, you know, what's gone on in Alberta in the last 30 years, uh, hydrologists, uh, environmental experts were probably either not contacted or maybe pushed to the side a little bit. Uh, I, I personally worked with a hydrologist here in Alberta that worked with Alberta Environment his whole career, I, I contracted him to do some work with us uh, after he retired in 20, 2011 in, in southern Alberta for to support some of the flooding. He told me tons of stories about how they met with High River Town of High River Council over over decades to warn them about the the potential risk of flood in the community and what it would mean. But nothing was ever done, and High River was allowed to develop. And, you know, I, I, I was in High River at the height of the flooding for many, many months, uh, driving through High River for the first time and just seeing the very peaks of the homes and condos in, in the floodplain was, was remarkable. And so, you know, where is that linkage with uh, disaster reduction policy development, built up areas, uh, new development, and and supporting communities that need that property tax income from, from those properties. We, I, I think there's a lot we need to do there in order to uh, maybe bring some transparency and openness to how Canada is developed in the next hundred years.
Um, we, you know, we're, we're going to be talking to futurists that specialize in planning for future scenarios that are 50, 60, 70 years out. That's what they do. And so they bring in a whole new set of tools and, and discussion considerations that help people uh, plan for what is it going to look like in 2080 in Abbotsford? You know, what, what, what is it going to look like in, in Southwest BC, uh, in the built up areas that are impacted by fire and, and floods? What's it going to look like? What do we want it to look like in 2080? Uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I lived on Vancouver Island for a, a significant majority of my life. I, BC is my second home. I, I went to high school in Sydney, BC on Vancouver Island, uh, right, right from the, the mid eighties into when I came back to Edmonton, Edmonton in 2000, uh, BC is my second home. I've drove, I've driven through Abbotsford and on the Coquihalla more, more times than I can count. And I know a lot of people from Alberta go to BC every year. Uh, I, I think the social fabric between Alberta and BC is high. You know, it's it's been an ongoing thing for so long. People flood from Alberta into BC and then BC back to Alberta and it goes back and forth. It's been going back and forth for so long that, uh, you know, I, I don't even think some people recognize a border uh, at times. I mean, I communicate with... Uh, MLAs in, in BC and, and follow them quite actively to keep up to date with what's going on in that in some of those communities because I'm interested because I very well may be living back out there one day, uh, hopefully. But uh, so those those are the conversations we're going to have. We're going to have Dr. Julie Gillette pop in uh, in about 10 minutes as long as there's no technical issues. And then we're going to have Shannon on uh, in about 45 in about 45 minutes or so. And so if you're just tuning in, we are live streaming uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I will get your messages and comments from YouTube and LinkedIn. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you need to go to YouTube and want to be part of some of the live chat, uh, just look for the Hazardscape channel. I think if you just search it, I'll, I'll pop up and you can go to our live section. Twitter, I will follow up with comments and, and things on Twitter um, as much as I can. But, uh, you know, as I look for a producer and a co-host, I'm, I'm kind of running things here on my own. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be spending some time kind of looking through some things. So if I look a little bit, bit distracted, that is why. But I want to make sure that we, you know, bring in the voices and comments of as many people as possible. All right, so uh, Julie has come on into the studio. I, I can see her sitting in the waiting room there. I'm going to bring her on. If, if she gives me a nod and she's ready, I'm just going to bring her on. So I will add uh, Dr. Julie Drillette to the stream. Let's test your audio. How is it working? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, my headset probably went off because I haven't needed it. Hang on a sec here. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, there we go. Now I got okay. you. Awesome. So thanks for uh, being the brave soul uh, and the first to jump on here on this live stream only after its first hour uh, of birth, I guess I'll call it. I don't know. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much for, for sharing um, this initiative with us. Uh, I, I'm located in Edmonton, Alberta today, um, and it's yeah. a real pleasure to join. Thank you. So I, I will... Um, I, I will speak very quickly about what you what I know about what you're doing. Uh, it's very limited. I know that you are uh, per, uh, you're a professor at the University of Calgary for, in in social work, That's uh, right. and you are the lead for I think it, the the correct name is Social Work Disaster Network. Yes, that's okay. right. Social Work and and Disaster Network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why don't you give us a quick uh, explanation of what the, the social, I, I I don't know if, do you say SWAD? Do you guys use that acronym? We do sometimes, it, yes. You do sometimes, S-W-A-D, whatever you want to call it. Give us a quick rundown of what you're doing because 
right now in BC, emergency social services is is gotta just be uh, through like they they must be at a, a, a in the red in in terms of RPMs. They must be running at like ten thousand RPMs. So give us a breakdown of of SWAD and and what it's meant to do. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so the Social Work and Disaster Network was launched in June of this year, um, and it came about as an outcome of uh, some research projects that we've been engaged in here in Alberta, um, following several disaster events. Um, many of you may have heard about the, or, or, are familiar, or maybe were involved with the 2016 wildfires in Fort McMurray and the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. Um, and I continue to be involved in a study looking at the role of social workers and human service practitioners in the aftermath of, of the wildfires with a focus on long-term recovery. And one of the findings that we have uh, drawing from research data with 140 participants is that many social workers and human service practitioners said that you know, they've become very involved in disaster recovery in local communities um, through their work in, in social services, in providing long-term supports uh, through services and programs um, that are delivered at, at the community level. This can take place in schools, it can happen um, in hospitals, through Alberta Health Services, and also in nonprofits and social service agencies at the community level. And, and what participants told us was that um, there was a real need to build connections and to continue to enhance um, capacity building for social workers engaged in this space. Because for, for some time now in social work education in the curriculum, this hasn't been an, an integral part of, of the, either the bachelor's or the master's program. Um, we're working to change that now. Um, we're looking to in include more focus on climate change and disasters and sustainable development um, as we're currently reviewing our curriculum. Um, but social workers and human service practitioners said, we need to be connected. We'd like to see a network to, um, be created to help build these relationships, which we know are so important in the aftermath of a disaster. Um, and also identify you know, training opportunities, what kind of professional development opportunities can be provided in, on an ongoing basis to really enhance preparedness at the local community level. So all of these ideas were kind of brought together um, through the creation of the Social Work and Disaster Network. Uh, we now have uh, just over 100 members across Alberta, but we've also had participants join from across Canada and also internationally, who I think are also maybe feeling a bit isolated at, in their communities and want to reach out and have conversations and exchange, you know, their knowledge, their learnings from disaster events. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's been interesting that this fall we organized a webinar series and every month we've had guest speakers talk about some of their work and their research. Next week on uh, Thursday, November 25th, we're offering a three hour workshop on community resilience. Okay. Uh, that, that will be facilitated and, and it's and then we're also offering psychological first aid training on December 7th um, oh yes yeah so and and that's that training is now full actually we've had to limit uh, participants to 30 but we are also planning to offer it again next year in 2022 after yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised by that uh, not not surprised by that at all because I think there's that there there is a real thirst right now for uh, people to get that psychological first aid, mental health training. I know uh, in my in my daughter's grade eight uh, class right now, they she's part of a group and they're they're learning about what they're calling psych aches. So instead of a headache, it's a psych ache, and and you know it's kind of scary for me because now they're going to recognize uh, that that maybe dad dad's on his third beer at the hockey game. Is that a psychological issue or is he just having fun? So now they're kind of critiquing me, but you know, that that's fantastic. So like around emergency social services, and we'll get into um, where people can find you kind of towards the end. I know you got to go at 11 mountain, but we'll, we'll get into where, where you're going, but in terms of emergency social services, um, you know, what, what do you think is going on on the ground in BC and, and, you know, is there a way that you can link in with them? Do you have contacts there um, that you're getting reports from? What's that network look like? 
Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so in, in our SWAD network, um, I'm one of the co-chairs and uh, the other co-chair is Bonnie Lewin. And she's yeah, a social okay. worker with the city of Calgary at Calgary Emergency Management Agency. Yeah. And she also chairs uh, ESS here in Alberta. Right. So she's very familiar with um, kind of ESS and, and plans and, and what that looks like. And I would say, you know, with our um, social work and disaster network, it might be there might be some individuals involved in ESS who are also social workers or human service practitioners, um, but some are not, right? So it's not the same thing. And, and I think this is some work that we're, we've recently written an article for a publication to kind of identify, um, you know, the ESS, it's not, when, when people think of emergency social services, I think they often assume that people are social workers and that's not right. necessarily the case. Um, you know, a lot of people involved in ESS are volunteers. Um, they've had some training. Um, sometimes they're from the affected community. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they might be brought in maybe from other parts of the province. Um, so we see kind of our work as a SWAD network has, has been different than ESS because ESS mm. is often involved in the short term. Right. Um, and we see our work happening more in the medium to long term. So in the right. months and years after a, a disaster event right. and um, building that capacity in local communities, you know, so where social workers live and work, you know, and have relationships already in place in the community that we're kind of enhancing and strengthening that local capacity so that after an event, social workers are supported to you know, to be bringing in like some of this recovery work in their actual practice um, that they've had, you know, drawing from social work theories like trauma informed practice, um, resilience, thinking about community development approaches, um, solutions focused work. Um, in our research project, we've identified theories and practice approaches that social workers use in, in their work um, that they they felt was relevant to disasters. So I think there are some important differences, but I also think there are areas that could complement one another. Mm. And, and so, you know, we're very interested, I would say, in connecting with ESS and seeing like, are there supports or synergies that, that could be leveraged, you know, to further strengthen um, the important services that are needed, particularly for vulnerable and marginalized populations. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's it's uh, it, it's I, I like how you you separate out the social work aspect with the kind of the ESS volunteer aspect because I think sometimes too emergency social services gets lumped into a lot of the NGOs that are out there because they take on a, a bit of an ESS role too you know, by providing uh, food and, and helping to volunteer at uh, reception centers. So, so, and, and I think communities, like every community has social workers, mm -hmm. right? And they, they are a very, I think, um, like they have, I don't, I don't know if this is a horrible term, but they've got their fingers in so much parts of a community. They really know what's going on at at not only the very individual family and personal level, but at a kind of a more systematic level, would that be fair to say? You're absolutely right. Um, a lot of social workers are are doing micro clinical work, but they're also mm. engaged at the meso and macro level, engaged in community development initiatives, and also at the policy level. Okay. So where, where I, I, I guess, so to me, Kind of what you're doing if we were to put it in a traditional emergency management sense you kind of work in like that preparedness uh phase if, if that's where if that's where we're going to place it and then you also um, may come in during response and definitely in that long-term recovery so you're you're really in an emergency management context you're really in bedded in that continuum yes I, yes that's okay. right okay and, um yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, social work is not emergency management and emergency social services is within the world of emergency management, but you know, they, they cross over so much, just like occupational health and safety, uh, fits into some aspects. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, what, you know, we're, 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 we're getting the attention of people across Canada right now, across BC, across Alberta. 
you know, what, what kind of support do you need to kind of continue on and grow? What, what do you hope, you know, if, if I were to give you a million dollars right now and say, okay, doctor, uh, you got a million dollars and uh, two more people and a ton of time, where, where would you place that, those resources? Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a, that's a great question. I would say uh, right now our SWAD network is we we're not funded. So we're doing oh, this okay. on a voluntary basis. Um, it's okay. hosted in the faculty of social work at the university of Calgary. Okay. You know, so if we had access to funding, you know, we would be able to, to involve uh, to hire student research assistants to um, continue to do work, to, continue to um, provide training, build in monitoring and evaluation, um, and really expand the scope, I think, of, of some of the work that we're doing. Um, we are, are The research that I'm leading on uh, the role of social workers and human service practitioners is funded through a SHRC Insight grant. Uh, we're currently in our fourth year of funding, and, our, and the project will be ending um, on March 31st, 2022. So we are beginning to identify what might be some new research questions um, to investigate. And so I think having a, a research component going ahead is going to be important. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in right now are, I would say, kind of the rising incidents of complex disasters. Mm. You know, so has these impacts of climate change are being experienced, you know, we're seeing communities affected by different types of disasters at the same time. And I think we need to really work to try and understand that because it's, there's no linear path here anymore. Like, you know, we're seeing in, in Merritt and in BC that, you know, the, the whole town's been flooded, but other communities in the interior, they were profoundly affected by the wildfires this past summer and now with the flooding all happening during the time of the COVID pandemic you know it's this is very complicated and you know could really challenge um you know some of the supports that that, that are available and so how do we kind of redesign support systems to provide this the ability to kind of recover but also prepare for the next event um, and really better understanding the risks, you know, that all communities experience um, and be able to address these in a better way. Yeah, that that's a that's something I kind of was speaking a little bit about before you came on was in Canada. Uh, we, we don't have a national that I know of. And, and, you know, if someone's out there and can correct me on this or point me to it, I, I would appreciate that. We, we don't have a national hazard identification risk assessment that organizations or communities or researchers can draw upon to say, oh, look, a lot of that research and data has been has been, you know, done and analyzed and, and turned into information. And and so, yeah, you're left struggling to kind of guess at, at what hazards are, you know, the most riskiest right now where are they the most, you know, riskiest right now? And, you know, how do we even start to assess that and, and plan for the future? Um, I know parts of Southwest BC have done a very good job in, in terms of uh, mapping, uh, you know, resilience in terms of, you know, creating data sets that show, you know, which community has a heat emergency plan, who has cooling or warming centers, who has an emergency plan, who's got emergency management bylaws and committees. And, and that informs and helps control risk in one way. But again, you know, to say that an area is susceptible to this or that, uh, it's not really well defined. Mm -hmm. And without that data, like, you know, where do we even begin? Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, you know, it's great to hear that you're kind of, you know, headed down that road. So really you need, um, you know, financial support like all of us. You need people. Uh, you probably need data and information. Uh, and, you, and you need that network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's correct. Yeah. And I would say as well, you know, as we're beginning to also build this capacity and understanding in the profession of social work, there are some really important spaces that we need to create interprofessionally. Yes. So, you know, it would be great if we could meet with emergency management and, you know, be invited to the table um, to share what our experiences are like in supporting 
uh, communities in the long term after a disaster and share some of our research results. Um, you know, in some cases in emergency management, there has been a reluctance to talk about resilience, right? And, um, you know, so we need to kind of go back and say we have the Sendai framework that has been that was passed with, with the UN in 2015. How can we implement that and put it into action? Yeah, that, you know, I, I was on Facebook, uh, the, the BC Emergency Managers Association Facebook uh, yesterday or the day before. And, uh, you know, a, a fairly well-known and experienced emergency manager out there by the name of uh, Bob Black. He used to be the uh, the emergency management senior official here for the city of Edmonton at one point. You know, he put out that question about, you know, you know, what what's wrong right now? What's going on? Kind of starting that discussion. And, you know, I, I went on my rant about, you know, one, we're really working in a system that was born out of the military. Uh, it's, 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 we've got this issue of, you know, in Alberta where, you know, military leaders would come into the Alberta emergency management agency and operate it under that model. Then we'd have fire services, uh, people take over as the lead and kind of run it like a fire services model. Then we'd be back to a, uh, someone in a position in the military and they'd come in and say their way is better. And I, I think people across Canada see this flip flop in emergency management between, well, the military way of doing it is better. No, the fire services or emergency services way of doing it is better. And really I'm at the point where like neither of them have worked. So how are we going to redesign some of this? And I think what you said earlier about relationships and, and developing relationships and those networks with a far more diverse and, and inclusive groups like that's where we need to start mm -hmm. and we do need to get better at that. And I think the emergency managers who are reluctant to, uh, you know, let go of their ego and, and let go of a lot of that. Um, I, I think they need to, to, to take a look and, and, and maybe start to step out of the way a little bit because they're not helping anymore. Um, I'm, I'm fine to say that I have no problem saying that. And I'm, I'm sure I'll probably get maybe some nasty comments somewhere on social media about that. But, uh, I know I, I, there's a lot of people right now that, that are thinking the same thing I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. yeah, no, thanks for making that comment. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we know in terms of recovery is that we need to engage the community. Yeah. Right? And, and so a top-down approach is not going to help facilitate that community participation and that community engagement. And so part of that is like, how do we create these new spaces to, to have uh, multiple diverse voices involved? Um, and I also think, you know, it, at the University of Calgary, we're talking a lot right now about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and also reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think this is a call for us as well to think about, you know, beyond academia in the community, how can we also foster and facilitate equity and, and recognize the importance of diversity and inclusion in these spaces? And, and I think when we look at these kinds of uh, humanitarian and disasters and emergency issues, like we need to also think about this because, you know, if we treat everyone the same, which often mm -hmm. is, is what a lot of mainstream organizations are looking to do, treat everyone the same and pr promote equality, it actually creates um, a lot of challenges because you know because of people's diversity you're not fostering an equitable approach you know yeah. and so thinking about how do we meet those individual needs and promote equity means that not everyone needs the same supports and you know so we need to kind of differentiate what that's going to look like and you know thinking about how this applies in in a disaster context and emergency management i think is um it, it's an important part of the equation around thinking about um doing things differently yeah and 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 just to go back in, into history a little bit alberta as an example in the early 2000s the alberta the the emergency management agency at the time uh was primarily a community <laughs> development arm uh all everything that uh, a lot of the the regional field officers did in Alberta was from a community development perspective. But at some point uh, between, you know, I want to say 07, 08 to, to 2011, uh, it changed to a more operationally focused 
uh, let's train people, let's exercise, let's help them with their plans. And so it went, it, it shrunk from this holistic approach to a very narrow focus. And, and I, I, you know, we can debate all day if that was the right thing to do or not, but I, you know, I can tell you right now, Alberta is not, I don't think Alberta is better off today than it was in 2005, switching models like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also find it, you know, talking about that inclusivity, um, you know, when you're in a meeting with, with people that are in uniform, like you walk into the meeting and already there is a complete segregation of, of people because they're not the same rank or they're, they're not at the same level and you know your place. So you, you may not be able to speak up. And so when you, when you off the bat, walk into a room full of people in uniform, it's very intimidating for a lot of people because you automatically don't fit in mm -hmm. and, and you, you won't. And, you know, right now the military in Canada is going, it's, you know, no secret. It's got some real big issues right now in terms of culture. Uh, yeah. That, that, you know, I, I, and I'm not going to dig out on the military, but you know, I want them in BC right now doing what they're doing. There's nobody else better suited for it. But when someone retires from the military uh, and, and they move into civilian life, that culture just doesn't disappear. It, it overflows into other aspects. And there's really good groups out there right now helping veterans kind of integrate into civilian and public service life. We need more of that for sure. But it's it's going to be, that's one area I think we need to talk about a little bit more and, and address. So when groups like you want to integrate with the emergency managers who are primarily emergency services, military personnel, retired, you, you've got that relationship and connection and understanding in terms of language, <laughs> process, ways of working. Um, I, you know, that's just how I see it. I don't, I don't know if anything I said sticks out for you, but. Yeah, no, and I think, I think you're raising some good points there and um, thank you for bringing that up. I would also say too, like our frameworks that inform our practice are also quite different. Yes. In, in social work, we're very focused on social justice. We use anti-oppressive and critical approaches to understanding, um, you know, the kinds of um, oppressions that can contribute to vulnerability and marginalization in society. And, um, you know, we're so, so that in itself, it, you know, provides um, another perspective, I think, that, that is valid, that, that needs to be valued in this yeah. context around, you know, how do we engage with, with vulnerable populations, understanding some of the structural and root causes of, of the marginalization and, and the challenges that individuals and families experience. We don't want to blame individuals for their situations. We, we want to um, empower them to help them overcome and, and go on a healing journey. And so these are very different approaches. And, um, you know, it's not a neutral space, I would mm -hmm. say, that we're starting to no. think about, you know, social justice and equitable approaches. Um, you know, so if we're not speaking the same language or we don't have that same understanding, um, you know, it would be great to start some dialogue. And um, this is what we're looking to do in social work is we'd like to engage with emergency management. And um, this article that we've submitted uh, to, to the journal, you know, it kind of identifies some areas where we might be able to collaborate and and start to think about like creating some of these new partnerships um, to yeah. kind of bridge the gap, you know, right now. That, that's awesome. We're good friends with the Canadian Journal of Emergency Management. Uh, Simon Wells is doing an, an excellent job there trying to, to connect that, you know, research, academic, operational piece together and giving that, that platform. I think we'll have him or someone from the journal on regularly here as well. So, um, you know, I, I invite you and, and your network, uh, if, if you, you know, reach out anytime uh to to come on here and share with us information if if we need to do a panel discussion with you and and some emergency managers and others uh very happy to facilitate that um uh, alicia here says yeah there is no one emergency manager management culture so we fit into our organization's culture and those cultures and they clash absolutely they they clash bad like oil and vinegar sometimes so 
a hundred percent alicia thanks for that comment that is is great actually alicia is now the manager for training with salvation army emergency disaster Hello. services so thanks for commenting on that so yeah anytime i know i know you've only got about nine minutes left um why don't we spend a, a quick few minutes here talking about where people can find you and and where they can connect in with the network and uh where you know what's what's uh what's the, what's the way to do that sure thank you so we have a, a facebook group page um so if you do a search under social work and disaster uh, you'll find us there yeah. um and then we also have a Gmail site. So we do also invite members to connect with us. And then um, we've, we're in the process of, we have we don't have a website yet, um, but it is something that we're thinking about. Um, well, let's get you a website. What do you, what do you need for a website? I, uh, what, what you just need, you just need a, a designer and a web service and some yeah. funding to keep it going. That that's right. Yeah. So it's, it's, right. not, it's not a huge ask, but we do need, you know, to have some design kind of put into the actual yep. uh, development of the website. Okay. And, and the, the purpose of the website is, is basically just going to be to at least get you an online presence, uh, you know, get you somewhere where you can send people other than Facebook to kind of learn about you and contact you. Exactly. So that's right. not a lot of, not a lot of need there. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's an emergency management student out there that is very passionate about uh, social, the social work aspect of, uh, you know, this world that, that would love to do it. We'll put that call out for sure and see what comes up. That, that sounds um, good. Thanks. Yeah. Your, your Facebook, what about, um, uh, so you've got the Facebook, what is the Gmail? The Gmail is the email address. Uh, maybe I could send it to you later. Um, yeah. Send it to me and, and we'll put it out there for sure. Sure. Uh, I think if you, uh, if you go on to, uh, let me just put it here. I'll pull it up here. Here, I, I can yeah. I can give it to you now. It's swadnetwork at gmail.com. Okay, swadnetwork at gmail.com. This is the uh, the Facebook page. I think if you just uh, go to Facebook and search social work and disaster network, it'll pop up. They're, they're already 110 members strong. Uh, this is this is not just an I'll you know, just because Dr. Uh, Drillet is in uh, Alberta, this is not just uh, an Alberta network. This is a, I, I think you're looking at a national network. It, it is evolving into a national it's network. Evolved, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're going to, you're going to go with the flow and, and see where it goes. I, I think it'll get bigger. Um, absolutely. So I don't know what, uh, if, if you've got questions quickly on the uh, YouTube live chat or LinkedIn, uh, please post them. We might have a quick time to get, get to them. There's a bit of a delay, but that's okay. What uh, what have we missed uh, that, that you uh, wanted to talk about? Anything? Yeah, no, no, thanks. I mean, maybe I could just say that, um, you know, next week we are organizing a community resilience model workshop. Okay. Uh, on November 25th, it will start okay. at 9 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time to 12 p.m. Um, and um, this this workshop is is open to to everyone. Um, one of our postdoctoral associates, Dr. Evelina Bogdan, uh, she's going to be uh, co-facilitating this workshop from Edmonton, um, along uh, with uh, a colleague uh, from the Trauma Resource Institute. Um, so if anyone is interested, we have um, a link on Eventbrite for registration. And then those participants who register for the workshop uh, will be sent the Zoom link afterwards. Awesome. Okay, that's great. So yeah, we'll we'll get that out through our, our uh, social media channels as well uh, with your contact info, the, the Facebook information. And, you know, whatever else you, if you can send me something, whatever else you can send sure. me, I know there's lots of people really, uh, you know, really in, in need of a better understanding of how social work can play a part in a community, especially as, as a resource. Uh, I definitely think it's underutilized, just like a lot of, you know, teachers and other people in the community are, are underutilized in emergency management. So I, I really appreciate you. You know, being the first one to to brave the the live internet and come out here and talk about this, we're gonna we'll have you back on uh, with with anyone else from your network that wants to talk on and discuss this. 
No, well, th thanks very much, uh, Brad, for sharing this initiative and and really for your leadership in this area. I think it's so important. And, um, you know, particularly during this time in BC, you know, our hearts really go out to, to you know, to, to those who have been impacted by this because we know the challenges associated with, with these kinds of events. And and I personally yeah. lived in the interior of BC and Kamloops mm. for a number of years. And okay. that's where I started some of my disaster research was, was in oh, Kamloops. Nice. And, partnering with EMBC and so um you know I'm familiar with with the roads and kind of the context of what's happening and um yeah our, our hearts awesome. really go out to those yeah I uh you know I I just I I know what people you know when they re-enter back in, into their homes uh th those who evacuated who have not been back to their homes yet you know, they're going to, I talked to so many people in High River and Calgary that just stood at the top of their stairs to their basement and looked at a basement of mud and silt. Yeah. And the, the feeling of what do I do? How, where do I start is so overwhelming. Um, I just, you know, I get the shivers thinking about, uh, about that moment for people when they, when they first get back home. So um, it's it's going to be very traumatic, uh, absolutely. And I think social workers are going to play a big part in that healing journey, as you said. Yeah, and it'll be important for people to reach out. You know, we yes. don't have to go through this alone. It's important to find these ways to bring community members together to support them um, in in this in this journey. Yep. No, no one's alone. Uh, you've got to take that first step and and ask ask for support. It is available. It is non-judgmental. No one is going to be judging you when you ask for help. Uh, social workers are very professional. They're objective. Um, they're, they're not judging you in any way. They know where you've been, where you've come from. So absolutely, let's, let's get the word out. All right. I want to get you out on time. So I really appreciate your time and we will, we will talk again. Thanks, Brad. Okay, Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was Dr. Julie Drillette from the University of Calgary. See, she's a professor uh, of social work. She leads the Social Work and Disaster Network, which you can find on Facebook if you do a search for Social Work and Disaster Network. Uh, they've got some events and, and training that are coming up that uh, fit within that realm of psychological uh, first aid, resilience, uh, connection building, relationship building, networking, all that good stuff that emergency managers need to form, you know, the networks and the collaborative environments that are going to help us be better prepared and ready for the future. And, and like I said earlier, um, you know, the culture of emergency management right now is it, it needs to be better. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not criticizing individuals that, that have come out of the, the military or fire services or emergency services. I, I critique a little bit more of the system that, that raised and trained them. Uh, I, I think, you know, in, in Canada, there's, there's a lot of change that's going to be taking on, uh, in, within the military culture. Um, I'm, I'm happy if, if you are, involved with any groups out there that are are helping to transition veterans from uh, the mil a military career into civilian life or public service please reach out to me directly and we'll, we'll have you on so we can talk about uh, about it from your perspective and, and how you see it and what you're doing and what resources are out there I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation because uh, I need to learn more about what is available and what's going on. I, I think that uh, a lot of veterans transition naturally into the field of emergency management. Uh, then they take training and get their education. And those cultures do clash. Uh, there's, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. They they do clash. And it's it's stressful in the workplace when you're you're trying to operate in in that culture clash without the tools and support to navigate it uh i i certainly did not have the, the right tools to navigate that when i was at the alberta emergency management agency and 
And, you know, I, I think for me, I've learned over the years that, uh, you know, there was a lot more that I could have done to better manage that relationship. But I was also at the point in my career where I had to make a decision around, you know, was I going to change and put in the effort required to, uh, to become more integrated with that culture? Um, no, I, I decided that I was not, that, that is not the, the uh, way that I wanted to go in my career and the government could not support me in, in that. Uh, so I made the decision to, to leave the government of Alberta because I knew that a lot of the change that I had to do internally was going to clash with my own motivational value system. Uh, you know, there, I was going to have to give up a lot of things about who I am in order to uh, fit in as as good as I as well as I could with that culture that at the end of the day, you know, I would still never be accepted. And and that's, I think, the issue with, you know, it's the chicken or the egg kind of thing. You know, do do veterans and those coming out of emergency services cultures, the RCMP law enforcement, you know, is it their job to to, to make that transition or is it our job to come closer to them? I, I think it's, I think there has to be a compromise in the middle and a recognition that there is a clash and there's going to be a clash and a willingness on both sides to want to work through that. And, and I don't think those conversations are being had at the right levels in a lot of organizations uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I mean, I've certainly got my opinion on why those conversations don't happen, but uh, I, I know they're not happening. And so part of this forum is is going to be to maybe shine a little bit of light on that elephant in the room and and maybe talk about it so we can move on uh, to to produce the system that we need in Canada to be better uh, for the future. So. We're going to get ready for uh, Shannon Solinsky with Autism Canada. She's going to be on in, in shortly here to discuss um, uh, livestock and, and some other things. Uh, I'm just scrolling through, you know, Twitter as I kind of go here. And I know um, the, the Salvation Army uh, Emergency Disaster Services, they have uh, a lot going on in terms of the the response so if if you follow them on twitter go to their website hey shem shem bundy's here uh shem yes you're going to come on because we need to talk about uh not only facilities emergency management but we i want to talk a little bit about governance uh in emergency management and you are going to come on and talk with us i i'm going to get you on here and you're coming on shem thanks for tuning in but the Salvation Army Emergency Disaster Services, uh, you can find them on Twitter. They are actively taking uh, donations. You can go to fundraise.salvationarmy.ca and take a look at uh, you know how you can donate to them. They are currently at 12% of their goal. Their fundraising goal is a million bucks. I would suspect that this has only been launched within the last couple of days. I I have a feeling that they're going to surpass their goal uh, pretty darn quick, uh, given given the national reach they have and the work that they do. If you've ever had a, Salma a Salvation Army hot meal uh, when you don't have a home to go to and, and no food available, like that is the shining light at the end of the tunnel. And I know Peron and his team, they just got a whole bunch of new... Uh, food trucks uh, this year that will will likely be rolling out. I'm not sure if, if BC got any new ones, but maybe maybe Peron is in a food truck right now rolling out uh, to BC across Canada in it. I don't know, but uh, if, if he is, that would be that would be great. And we're gonna get Peron on here uh, in the coming days to talk about you know his role, his team's role, what they're doing in BC. And depending on where Peron gets, you know, hopefully he'll be able to share a little bit with us about what's going on on the ground. 
uh, with the Salvation Army. So that will be will be coming up too. So before Shannon jumps on, uh, again, this is the agency. We are uh, creating a daily live stream every day uh, for as long as I can sustain this uh, between 8.30 to around 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9.30 to 12.30 uh, Mountain Standard Time. And it's, it's a place to have uh, a discussion about emergency management in Canada. We want to raise the profile and amplify the state of disaster and emergency management in our country. And, and maybe, just maybe, the right people will be listening. And, and we can get some, some people in here that can help start to create that change that we need to see across the country. And when I say change, I mean, uh, you know, no more uh, rural uh, chief administration officers in a community of, of you know, four or 5,000 that are not only responsible for running their community, they're responsible for emergency management. No more uh, under-resourced uh, communities. They, they need to have dedicated professional emergency managers on staff that, you know, like Dr. Dr. Julie was talking about that can focus on creating the relationships and the networks and the connections that are needed to be better at what we do. Uh, we need those full-time resources that are a hundred percent focused on their job. No emergency manager should be doing their work off what's called the side of their desk. Uh, given where where this country is headed in terms of um, you know disaster, trying to reduce disaster risk, that's that's got to be the primary objective. You know, uh, our crumbling infrastructure is not going to withstand some of the weather events that that are that are uh, that are coming up. Um, you know, you look at Abbotsford area; they've flooded like they have four times over the last hundred years. What, you know, what significant changes have prepared them for this? And, and I can tell you, you know, politicians have a hard time with this because uh, their, their cycles are so short. Um, but if you've ever heard the story of Duff's Ditch out in Manitoba, um, that was, uh, I think he was the, Roblin Duff was the premier of manitoba for a time and uh he campaigned to have the red river floodway basically dug around uh winnipeg so to mitigate flooding and he lost his seat uh in government because he spent so much money on on what's called you know, they, some in Manitoba will call it Duff's Folly, but it's Duff's Ditch. There was so much money spent on it. You know, farmers and, and those in the, in, in the urban areas kind of just said, great, you spent millions of our tax dollars on a giant ditch around Winnipeg. Well, that that ditch in the last 30 years has saved our country billions of dollars in in flood recovery. That investment uh, almost 60 years ago today is still paying off, keeping people safe, keeping their homes safe, and, and reducing the, the disaster risk on many of the areas and the agricultural operations around Winnipeg. So we need those kind of bold politicians uh, to come into government, risk you know, their per political careers in a four year time span, get the work done. And then, yeah, maybe they exit, but they're left with a legacy that is going to span on, you know, centuries. Uh, if, if you're looking to get into politics, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a term for this. Maybe we'll, I'll make it up right now. Maybe we'll call it turn and burn politics. I don't know. But if, if you're an aspiring politician, and, and you think you could get to the level of a, of a premier in a province and, and you're not scared of being bold and, you know, coming in for a short four years to, to, 
to turn and burn quick, but get some significant uh, mitigation projects underway and built in a province, um, that's going to be one way that we move forward, uh, I, I think, because again, taxpayers are are ruthless. And if, you know, look at Calgary, look, look at the Springbank, uh, the Springbank Dam project that was was born out of the 2013 floods that project I, I think has only started started to to get approval now uh eight eight years after the flood because there there is so much uh, outcry from the public they didn't want it in their backyard um, funding uh, where to put it how to build it all these politics came into play and the community is is still at a high risk because it's still not built. But, um, you know, I, I understand nobody wants it in their backyard. But uh, do you want your backyard to be, to drift away, right? Or or do you would would you like to keep your backyard? I guess. Um, so we'll we'll talk about a lot of that coming up here uh, as we live stream every morning. I'm even going to do Saturday and Sunday. Uh, even if I'm on for, for an hour and, and and don't get much traction, I'll come on. If it doesn't go anywhere, I will log off. And if this initiative, you know, ta tapers off over, over the next couple of weeks, then fine. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll end it. I have no problem, uh, you know, trying to build something up. And if it doesn't get traction, walking away from it and moving on to the next idea. But I, I think there's their support and and i know a lot of emergency managers in canada they work for government and or their private sector and and they you know if they work in government they they are not allowed to rock the boat uh because they've got uh communications people on their back they've got people uh their their met their boss that that you know, politicians don't want government staff coming out and talking about these things. So that that's a real problem because we can't have these open discussions with the people on the ground in the jobs. So if you are an emergency manager and you've got something to say, email me directly at brad.eisen uh, at hazardscape.com. I will keep uh, your your name and your title and your organization. Uh, confidential. I will I will read your emails live on air as part of the discussion. Um, I I uh, you know I am an, a, a professional accredited a coach through the International Coach Federation. In all of my dealings with with my business and what I do, uh, confidentiality is the number one uh, priority. Uh, if I if if I don't uh, instill confidentiality with those I work with, I lose my accreditation and I'm no longer a coach. So I will be bringing that level of confidentiality to this under a, a global standard that's been developed by the International Coach Federation for a long time. Whether that means anything to you or not, or gives you any more confidence or not, that's up to you. But uh, email me, phone me, text me, whatever you like. I will bring your thoughts live uh, to our audiences to spark that dialogue and conversation with, you know, average Canadians who, you know, in my opinion, uh, I, I think they need to have a little bit more knowledge and understanding about the emergency management that's going on in their communities or the lack of it. And, and the reasons for that, we need to shine that light and amplify. So I'm just waiting a little bit for, uh, uh, Shannon Selinski from Autism Canada. She's going to be coming on live with us to talk uh, a little bit. I got to keep more water on here next time. Heck, maybe we should even do like uh, a 24 hour telethon. Maybe we should do a 24 hour telethon to raise money uh, for, for some of these things. So if if anyone's out there listening and you're, you are interested in doing a 24 hour telethon, I will stay up all night with you and do that. All right. Shannon is on deck. Let's see. Here we go. Hi, Shannon Solinsky. Hey, Brad. How are you doing? Good. You thank you for uh, braving 
the internet airwaves and and being the second to jump on here and and chat about what's going on in bc and what's going on with emergency management in canada you're very welcome thanks for having me and if anything gets glitchy we'll blame rural internet yeah you're out in uh where are you again Just I forget. east of bicycle so northeast of calgary northeast of calgary uh rural internet it's not quite out there yet hopefully when it does get there they don't charge you an arm and a leg um, but you are a, a past fire chief, uh, captain and training officer. captain, sorry. Yeah. Captain and training officer. You work extensively with emergency management logistics, Canada. You train the search and rescue for autism with autism, Canada, right? What as else? well as the emergency preparedness for autism, Canada. And I have worked on emergency planning for animal emergency response, as well as human right. vulnerable populations. Yes. Awesome. So tons of on the ground experience, lived experience. The curriculum for the search and rescue for autism is top notch. Uh, I know you unfortunately had to launch that at the start of COVID. So, you know, your your cross Canada tour was in-person tour was negated but you you've been doing it virtually and and and, and you've been reaching some audiences we've been so actually reaching some international audiences oh. we we've had folks from new zealand take the training as well as in wow. the u.s and we've had interest from another another group of countries in europe so we definitely are proving the interoperability of that training and we've expanded it congratulations Thank you. Uh, that that's excellent outreach. So, wh wh where do you want to focus uh, right now? Because I'm going. You'll you'll be on again. Yes. Um, we'll have you on again. So, where where do you want to focus right now? What are you seeing as some you know some critical information or knowledge that you could you could share? Maybe do you want to stick on the livestock area. What what do you think? I think probably the livestock one I'd like to be a little bit more prepared for because we kind of did okay. this um, a little fast. But to come on after Dr. Gillette, I think that to just support the idea that when we are including vulnerable populations such as the autism community and other neurodivergencies, that if we are including them in our planning, that they become participants in it and not just recipients. Yep. And we don't want to have people feel like they don't have any input. And this applies to, you know, farmers and support people in agriculture, as well as people in vulnerable populations. And I don't even like using that term. It's one of those things that labels are good for spreadsheets and for boxes and file folders, not great on people. They tend to be sticky, they tend to be limiting, and we want people to tell us what works, what supports they need, and then find ways to accommodate that so we don't have secondary incidents. Because in a situation like they're facing in BC, one person who bolts from a, you know, a shelter that's not fully prepared becomes a search and rescue incident on top of already very active situations that's very preventable. Right. And yeah, we absolutely. have trained a lot of teams in BC. So I actually am very proud that we have, you know, had so much training with the BC teams. And I know that they're going to be using that training to support their communities and those evacuations, shelter in place, and actually setting up those shelters because they do understand that there's small things that you can do that have a significant impact. You know, um, one of the things that you had mentioned before was the sensory support kits that we have. And those are there to help someone who maybe ha doesn't have their sensory support item with them, or maybe they need one because it is highly stressful. It's overwhelming. This is a situation that's overwhelming for everyone, and it's going to have impacts on everyone. But someone who is like my family, neurodivergent with autism, other neurodivergencies, that overwhelm can be very hard to manage, especially when you're trying not to be, you know, add to someone else's stress or you're just trying to be able to be a part of making things better for yourself, not just to be a recipient, which is a pretty passive thing, but to actually be an active participant in finding ways to make it better. 
And when we listen to those voices, when we engage those community members, we hear the small changes that can make an, acu an evacuation better or the small changes to a bug out bag. We see a lot of promotion, a lot of information about getting those 72 hour kits, getting your bug out bags ready. We don't talk about what things someone might need beyond medication. What if someone needs that weighted blanket? They need extra batteries for a device. They need those sensory support items to help them manage that stress. That's a legitimate preparedness message we need to be able to get out to people so that they feel supported, seen and heard, and that our facilities managers, our emergency responders can respect that if it's important to that person, it doesn't have to make sense to us. It doesn't have to make sense to them. If it's helping that person manage this stressful situation, respect it and carry on. It's not, it's not really a complicated thing when you look at it as an inclusivity and a diversity and an acceptance part of getting through something that is incredibly stressful on everyone involved. I mean, even sitting here in Alberta, I know people in BC, I know people in emergency management, I know farmers, I know neurodivergent families that are struggling with all of this and I wish I could help. And knowing that we have trained people out there that will be able to help makes it easier. And it also reminds me that we need to do more training and we need to have more conversations around what actually supports people so that we can have, because this isn't a one-off. Mm -hmm. You know, we're no, going no. to have severe weather. We're going to have these cascading effects. But it also wasn't a surprise. The atmospheric river in the Pineapple Express was seen as being heavy. We saw them hit California earlier this fall. There are preparedness messages that we could be getting out to families and communities and organizations to have them be ready and to be proactive. I'm very much, and that's probably the training officer in me. I'm a little overtrained on being proactive, mm -hmm. but I would much rather be proactive than sit back and be reactive or even worse, sit back and go, somebody should do something about that. We need more people to say, I'm not waiting for someone. I'm going to be that someone. Yeah. And well, then and, yeah, and, and whether you need uh, a cigarette or a beer or a weighted blanket uh, to to deal with a situation or or to kind of help comfort yourself, right? What's the big deal? Um, you know, let's let's get those tools into the into the hands of communities so so they can make lives a, a little bit easier. And, and yeah, you know, put on your training officer hat. That That's okay. Um, you know, part of this live stream in this forum is to help, uh, you know, people in Canada who really don't know anything about emergency management become just a little bit more familiar about it so they can help advocate for it in their community. Um, you know. And I think also to create those relationships so that we have two-way productive communication when someone from the autism community goes to their emo or to their disaster services rep that they're being heard that that community voice is respected and if someone comes and says we need accommodations or we're willing to support you with this that there's an openness to hear what the diverse communities need. We tend to be very homogenous and like to put people in easy to manage categories and back to the labels, put labels on them. People are way more resilient than we give them credit for. And there's so many people out there who want to help and may have the capacity and capability to help, but have never had the door open for them to help. And we need to be able to say to our communities, post event. What did we do that worked? What didn't work at all? And if you were planning it, how would you have made changes? What would you have done? Because we know from respectful communication, we know from listening to our communities that it's so small changes that can make such a huge difference. And in an event like this, where everything is amplified, 
those small supportive changes can become the game changers that make it that much easier. And it makes those communication pieces to the public that much clearer and also gives us a chance to really engage with our community. Because if we are truly going to be diverse and support the diversity that makes up our communities, we have to include that in our planning. We have to be proactive in emergency management and it can't be what it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, it, it comes to that point of, you know, communities know what, what they, what, what will work for them. So rather than, you know, kind of parachuting in with a bunch of tools and telling them how to use it, just offer, offer the, the tools let them assess them, provide them support when they need it. But I mean, most communities will figure out on their own how to use a tool or how to, you know, propagate it through their, through their community if given the opportunity. And And all disasters start locally. So we already know where they're going to start. So we need to help those communities with risk assessments We need to do risk assessments. When we have a province that's got three main highway corridors, we need a risk assessment on who can get stuck there, who will survive it, and what supports they need. If we have communities that have specific response needs, they need to assess what do we have in our community, what do we have in our region, and what are we going to need if it gets out of hand or it scales up. Then we can start building that community resiliency Because they're not just waiting for that parachute drop. They're actually telling us to follow the metaphor where the LZ is, what they need to have dropped in and who they need to have brought in to support that. But so often there's a tendency to come in and say, well, we'll take over or we'll take care of things now and forget that when we leave, that community still has to put the pieces back together and get ready for the next event. How can we be proactive in building those tools like EML is doing with taking logistics off the clipboard and off the side of the desk and making it an interactive, really tech-based solution to connecting community resources? How do we do that for any size of community? Because it's scalable. Everything that we do is scalable. If it's an emergency in a small community or a large one, it comes down to scalability and resource access. Yeah, there, there. It's it's introducing that much needed uh, sort of workflow, emergency management workflow upgrade, a little bit of automation in into a process that is often really bogged down in procurement and having to find the needle in a haystack um you know like eml canada i think over this summer put out like this got this odd request for like some sort of filtration systems that that a doctor in calgary was looking that you know it's just like like you know you've got doctors from alberta health services making requests for equipment because they need to get them into the hands of pregnant women and and so like that's a huge issue right like they 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 should not necessarily have to be taking on that role i know there's some other context with that case uh it just wasn't all on ahs but um emergency management logistics canada is one example of a technology in the emergency management community that can help reduce the workload on community so they can focus on the things that that are not quite automated or or as efficient And it also allows communities to be connected with their local resources because we know that we're going to be, again, scalable. Once the local resources have been all deployed, then we need regional, then we need more. But we really need the training to support that and the communication tools and being open to someone who can come in with some expertise I remember when we first started talking about autism and search and rescue and autism and emergency management, and now it's grown to include more of the neurodivergent community. What role does this have? Well, they're part of our community, so they have a place and a voice that needs to be heard regardless. But when you can look at how it 
training and information can help support ESS, it can support evacuations, it can support messaging, then you start seeing the value of engaging your community beforehand so that when you do need to have them be ready to act during an emergency or a disaster, they're already familiar, people are comfortable with communicating and the messages and the roles are clear. It's not all of a sudden a new thing someone has to adapt to. It's something that is part of the normal conversation. It's part of the, you know, I laugh every year when people are surprised by winter storms. Mm. It's not like they really sneak up on you. You can watch the radar. You know the conditions are right. We have a lot of really amazing meteorologists that can tell us really good parameters of what to expect. That is a good window to start preparedness messaging. That's a good window to start talking about evacuations. This summer, we worked on our bug out bags because of wildfires. We knew mm -hmm. that if it got into the dry grass and the windy day, we don't have a lot of options. And we worked on our bug out bags. We worked on our tornado planning. We plan for it. And we talk about what do you need to be comfortable if we have to leave our home? Some things can't go, but some key supports can. And if you can carry it, I'm not going to argue with you about it. If that's important to you and it's going to help you get through, then great. So the yeah. essentials for one person may be very different looking for another person, depending on where they're at and what supports they need. We can offer a checklist and guidance, but we really shouldn't ever be in a position of policing that. We should be more in the role of how does this fit with what we're doing to support our whole community and to understand that some of the barriers are going to be language. Some of them are going to be sensory. Some of them are going to be cultural. But none of those things are insurmountable if we're open-minded enough to actually learn from the people that we're supporting and not, jo not just expecting them to fit into their column in the spreadsheet or their column you know, in the file folder and that they're actually a part of it because we know that there's a lot of resiliency there that we're not tapping into and our communities have a lot to offer emergency management and emergency social services, but we're not starting those conversations outside of an emergency to build those relationships. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, so let's, let's just say, for example, someone, you know, in South, an emergency manager or planner, uh, is, is, you know, watching this or listening to this afterwards, um, and, and they're responsible for some advanced planning or, or things like that. Like what are the, the main considerations for them when they're looking at like neurodiverse families or, or communities in terms of, you know, what are some things that they can incorporate into their plans that's going to really help them in an immediate short-term recovery? Probably the biggest thing is if you are on a path to returning to a new normal, because we know the cleanup is going to be long. We know it's going to be a lot of changes. Engage with that community to communicate that and find out what they need. Get some training for your teams. You know, connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out to me through Autism Canada, get some training for your teams and your staff. But the most important thing is to find those community leaders, whether they're organizations, um, you know, when BC Canucks does a lot with autism through their foundation and they work a lot with kids and sport, which can be a great way to get back to normal is to get those activities happening again, to normalize those scheduled things everyone lost during the pandemic and now have lost due to the situation in BC. But to really understand what supports those communities need to help get things back to normal. Maybe someone needs to source a specific food. Maybe someone needs to have remote access to an OT because they can't physically get to the OT because they're in an area where there's no road access right now. As we look at recovery, we also can start planning for our next response. What can we do next time to make our shelters better? What can we do next time for our preparative messaging? And then we look at it as a cycle because it's not an end-to-end -end line. You and I both know that it, it's very much cyclical. Once we get into recovery, the first thing we're doing is getting ready for the next one. And it yeah, may not I'm, be the 
same, but the supports are going to be needed the same. So we're not looking at the same type of situation, but that same supportive messaging and communicating with those community members is going to be key. And the other thing is training and understanding what the risks are in your community. Someone who's used to going hiking or biking on certain trails that are not accessible may not really understand that and may try to use those facilities or those paths anyway. Someone who bolts away from what we believe is a safe shelter because it's sensory overwhelming or it's too crowded, then we've added a search and rescue incident on top of everything else. How do we support them so that they understand that this is a safe place and that going back to where it's not safe even though it did feel safer than where they're at now is the right thing to do. And how do we support their overwhelmed family members? Well, and that's what I'm kind of trying to get at, right? Yeah. That that's what I'm trying to get at is, you know, right, right now we've got people in, in BC that are, that are thinking, okay, we've got thousands of evacuees that, that we're preparing for, for reentry when, when it's safe to do so. Um, you know, if, if I was a, a parent in that situation, you know, I, I might bring my kids to to see the house, but I, I definitely don't think I would want them, you know, with me, not only because of the, the dangers, but, you know, we've got cleanup to do. So, so can communities now start you know, and if there's anyone out there that's got an example of this where it, where it's been done or it's worked, but, you know, I'm wondering, like, you know, child care facilities, mass child care facilities that communities can start planning for in, in the Abbotsford area, Princeton Hope area. So parents can go and, and do the cleanup and the, and take on that work, but get, you know, the right kind of support and child care that they need for their kids that are that are on the neurodiversity spectrum. And the thing is, is that it's not just kids. An adult on the spectrum or a neurodivergent adult or a neurodivergent senior is going to be having a lot of the same sensory overwhelm. They're going to have some of the same sense of, I just want to go home and have it be normal. And then they go and they see their home and the idea of the cleanup has become overwhelming. Those families need support too. They may need extra hands to help with that. Because their loved ones are looking at it and in their normal nine to five where they can manage their environment, no one really knows they're neurodivergent or it doesn't stand out. But when they're faced with this that's overwhelming, they're going to need those extra supports. We don't talk enough about autism outside of children, but you're born on the spectrum. That means it's with you your whole life. You're mm -hmm. neurodivergent the whole lifespan. It's not something that you outgrow. It's not something that fundamentally ever leaves you because it's part of your brain wiring. A friend of mine calls it a different operating system. Those families are going to need specific supports as they get into the cleanup. And it needs to be something that if someone says, I need an extra hand because my family's overwhelmed, that our first response is, oh, you've got to tough it out, everyone else is, or, oh, I'm sure you can try. If someone says they can't do it and they need support, our first thing should be, how can we support you? What do you need? We'll see if we can find something. Because someone yeah, sure. has to qualify that they need support. If they're overwhelmed and they're already taking care of their family and trying to figure everything else out, if they say, this is too much for me, then we need to be accepting of that and appreciate the vulnerability it takes to say that in the first place. And secondly, say to them, what do you need? I need a contractor who's going to come in and explain to me every step of what has to be done. I need someone to come and help me clean up. I need someone to find these specific groceries <laughs> because we're going to need them. If someone has asked for help, we should be open to saying, what is the help you need and how can we do it? And not comparing, well, these people were able to do it and you're not. It's, it's not that simple, especially for folks who are neurodivergent. And the disability community is going to be the same way. There's going to be a lot of capacity there to support the cleanup, but there may not be the physical capabilities. 
and they already have other stuff that they're taking care of for their own health and wellness. We just need to stop, you know, thinking about it as we can all push through and tough through it. You're tough through it. Am I tough through it for the same situation? Yeah, it's not the same. Different. It's not going to be the same. And I can't expect you to have my same resilience, just like you can't expect me to have yours or that we deal with challenges the same way. And it's more amplified for those communities because they're used to having to qualify every request for help and yeah. figure it out on their own. This isn't something you can do that with. Well, and I think you're kind of getting to that point where, where I wanted to get to was, um, you know, they're, I don't know, may, maybe they're the, the supply it, it, chain is, is so impacted right now. There's not going to be a lot of those products available on store shelves. So, you know, you know, if, if I'm a, a, a planner or a recovery planner thinking about you know, some of these things that I'm going to have to kind of consider, um, you know, they, I, I think like, do, do they go to the autism Canada website? Is, is that the best place for them to go? Like, where's the best place for policymakers or planners to go as they start to take on the, the role of policy writer and, and recovery planner over the next three to six months? Um, they can connect with us through the Autism Canada um, okay. website. We can get them in touch with our family support team, which is amazing. They can connect directly with families and help them. Um, you know, there's lots of one-on-one -on -one things that can be supportive of families. For those emergency planners, for those community leaders, they can reach out to me and I would be happy to sit down with them. We can do you know, a quick assessment of where they're at, where their community is at, maybe identify some community members that would be good liaisons or supports. And we can have those conversations to figure out what their community needs and then what the capacity is to deliver that and what the middle ground might be. Yeah. Okay. That's uh that, that's the kind of stuff I'm trying, I want to get at is, is that assessment piece that there, there is support out there uh, for emergency managers uh, who are in a planning role or a policy role, whatever it is, th they can reach out to you. And, and a lot of that research and work is already done. It's all done. We have, yeah. we have the capacity to run them through an assessment of the suitability of their sheltering and evacuation and shelter in place plans to support the autism community and neurodivergent community members. We have training, not just for search and rescue, but also for emergency management and preparedness. We take an all hazards approach to things and we look at it from a community impact, but also from a community engagement perspective where those community voices that we need to hear have specific messages for us that we can put into that planning and we can implement. Because if something to you looks perfectly normal and you intuitively understand it someone who's autistic or neurodivergent may look at it and not see it the same way at all understanding those differing perspectives whether it's you know a hazard assessment for a search and rescue team or for a parks facility or when you're looking at developing a shelter or an evacuation plan we have the tools developed. We're just ready to be able to start having those conversations and putting those pieces together with the agencies and the individuals whose work is going to involve that. Yeah. Awesome. So if, if you are, are, are tuning in right now and you've got that uh, space in, in your, your, your time uh, to add, you know, this, this piece to your plans or, or to your policy or to your workflows, whatever it is in emergency management. Uh, yeah. Autism Canada is, is, is done a lot of that work. I was talking to uh, a regional director of emergency management for a group of summer villages who was kind of talking to me about the pain they are going through in researching business continuity practices. And you know, I just kind of thought to myself, wow, you, you've done a, a ton of work on your own to research stuff that, you know, maybe making one phone call to the, you know, DRI, uh, Disaster Recovery Institute, you know, they, they could have got some of that. So it's the same thing with you. 
Uh, if if you're an EM planner or or director of emergency manager who has uh, people in your community where you need to to at least fit in your plan uh, aspects of of neurodiversity or autism, like reach out to uh, Shannon directly or Autism Canada. Like where where can people find you most? LinkedIn, Twitter, LinkedIn is website. usually the fastest. If okay. someone really wants to reach out fast, they can reach me on LinkedIn. My email is on the Autism Canada webpage, and that's autismcanada.org. Um, Twitter. Um, yeah, just reach out. Have those conversations. We're open to working with people, communities, and organizations where they're at. There's yeah. no universal you know, cookie cutter that will stamp out a perfect plan. But there are paths forward. We just need people to be willing to engage in some new thinking and doing things a little bit differently because we know it's not a recipe for success to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Mm. And if we want different results for our communities, we have to start looking to our community members for those different steps to take. And from the trainings I've done and the conversations I've had, no one needs to be worried that this is a big change or big changes. These are really smaller incremental changes that have a significant impact that the reason they're not being done is most often they're not being thought of or they're overlooked because no one really thought that it would have a big impact, but they do. They really yeah. can have a big impact and they're not big things. They're small things that that can really help. And when I say help, we can potentially be saving lives, preserving mental health and supporting families and communities who are struggling. And that's pretty much all of us for the past couple of years with the pandemic and severe weather and, you know, name it, it, it gives us a place to build community. And at Autism Canada, we're very much about supporting our autism community but also all Canadians because we all live in our communities together. So it's, there's no silos. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And I, I appreciate that. And I know like we could, uh, we could go on forever and ever, but I'm, I'm coming back here daily every morning. And I, I imagine I've got, uh, I've, I've got to get to some, some stuff to, to, to get tomorrow ready. So I really appreciate you coming on. You, you will be back. We'll have you back. Yep. Uh, absolutely. To talk about other subject areas. Uh, Shannon, I really appreciate your time. I, I'd i like to keep going, but I know I got to get off of here soon, too, and, and get on with other things. But I really appreciate uh, you coming on here as the, the second brave, courageous person of, of the day to, to try this out. Well, thanks for having me. And I look forward to getting back on with you again. And we can talk about animal emergencies. Absolutely. OK, take care. Take care. All right, that's uh, Shannon Selinsky from Autism Canada just talking about uh, a, a few things. And so, you know, with, with Dr. Julie and Shannon, like, you know, I, I could have spent another hour with each of them. Um, they're, they're just a pleasure to talk to because they, they know uh, they're, they're leaders in their fields and they know what's going on and they're working directly with uh, you know, Dr. Julie is working directly with social workers and communities. Shannon is working directly with first responders uh, all over the world now and families that are that are facing uh, emergencies and disasters who also uh, have autism. And, and so we'll have them back on for sure. Um, I, I want to end today with uh, saying, you know, if you have an interest in joining this conversation, please reach out directly to hazardscape.com slash agency. You can uh, book some time there. We'll, we'll get you on. Um, I want to make one final last plea for uh, anyone out there looking to donate for the BC floods. We've got the Salvation Army campaign in full swing. You can find them on Twitter, uh, salvationarmy.ca forward slash BC flood. You can uh, look at that. They've already gone up 1% in their goal uh, since we checked uh, in ha in the last half an hour. So that's, that's the equivalent of about, it looks like maybe 20 or $30,000. So that's fantastic. Uh, please give to them. Uh, again, if you want to come on and, 
and and chat and and have a discussion as forum share your knowledge help educate uh, other emergency managers help educate the average canadian on what we do and and what we do in communities please reach out directly to me i would love to have you on we are going to be back here tomorrow morning live at 8 30 pacific standard time uh, 9 30 mountain standard time i don't know how long we'll be on for it depends on our, our lineup will be back Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, as long as I can keep going. Uh, if you're interested in uh, hosting or co-hosting or producing this as well and, and stepping up to that, please contact me and uh, we'll, we'll work something out. But until tomorrow, and in the meantime, stay connected. <laughs>